Good morning, and welcome to our service of worship today. I hope that in some small way, our service will cause our souls to smile, our hearts to dance, our fears to flee, our minds to rustle, and our loneliness to find company, as well as our spirits to meet God personally, and even in these difficult days, our tongues to sing praise to God. Now Denise will lead us in our call to worship. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now, I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my mouth and let me bear gladly the warm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare love with thy children thus to share. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see, open my heart and live in me, spirit divine.
God who has created us and who sustains us. We come now with thanksgiving for these moments when we can in this quiet of our homes. Listen for your compassionate voice within. Bring to light that spirit within us that draws us towards you, towards all our brothers and sisters. A spirit that is deep, respected, gentle, Give us now humble hearts to admit when we fail to acknowledge your loving spirit and trust to embrace our acceptance. As we worship today, clear our minds, open our hearts, and empower us with your spirit that enables us to bring that healing bond of God to all we need to. We pray this in the name of Christ, whose life and love would not be stamped out whose resurrection hope is a hope which plants love and peace in our lives, and lures them to sprout and bloom and blossom like spring flowers in the morning sun. To all this we say, Amen. And now Denise will read our scripture lessons for today. Our first scripture this morning comes to us from the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 to 39. <laughs> Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is. She is a sinner. And from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 and 34, the greatest commandment. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, and noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well, said the teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other than, but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Thus ends this morning's scripture.
This morning I would like to talk to you, oh, you don't mind if I sit, I'm sure most of you are sitting down watching this program. Um, talking about the old saying, seeing is believing. What are we seeing today? You see this? Do you remember last Easter? The sun was shining, the church was filled, we had a great breakfast, the kids were outside, honey eggs, gathering them up in baskets. That was then, and this is now. I can already believe what we're seeing. I now wear a mask. And most of you may do the same when you go out. In a short period of time, oh, about three weeks, we went from one death to nearly 40,000 due to a pandemic. And we are closing in on perhaps a million in our country. We have come in contact with this virus. How do we to respond to all this? How are we to understand that? What questions are we supposed to ask about our lives? What about our faith? Let me remind you of a story that maybe help us put all this in perspective. It's about a family that lived in Westchester County, New York. Now the father was a workaholic. Spent very little time with his son. And his son was soon to be a teenager and his mother said to his to the father, hey, look, uh, he's going to graduate one of these days and be out of our lives. Maybe you want to spend more time he said, well, what should I do? And she said, well, why don't you just pack up a lunch, drive down the Henry Hudson Parkway, and take him into the city. Okay, good idea. So they packed the lunch, hopped in the car, and there they were, driving down the Henry Hudson Parkway. That's a river on one side, beautiful morning. And as they got closer to the city, the boy spotted a statue of a horse man riding on top with a sword sticking out. And he said to his father, what is that? Who is that on that horse? What is that statue? And the father said, you know, I, I really don't know. <clears throat> so they kept going. And finally, the boy spotted this huge bridge across the Hudson River, double-decker, thousands of cars on it. He said, look, Dad, look at that. He said, what is that? What's the name of that bridge? I've never seen anything like it. Well, they said, you know, I don't know. So they drove into the city, turned on 42nd Street, went down the ways on the 34th Street, stopped, and there was this huge building. The boy looked up, couldn't hardly see the top. He said, Dad, what's the name of this building? And the father said, you know, I don't really know. So they went further on, down towards the another part of the city, and he saw this huge, looked like some kind of bowl outside this building. He said, what's that? He said, I don't know. Isn't that amazing? That, that huge bowl? Then they went further on, and another big building with about 130, 40 flags on the outside. <clears throat> the son said, wow, look at all those flags. What is the name of that building? The father said, you know, I don't know that either. So they drove around some more. Then they finally found a park, sat down and packed their lunch. And the boy said to the father, Gee, Dad, I hope you don't mind me asking so many questions. And the father said, No, not at all. How do you expect to learn anything if you don't ask questions? Come. How do you expect to learn anything if you don't ask questions? You know, crisis in life forces us to ask questions maybe we've never asked before. 
COVID-19 is doing that. But what we see is hard to believe. I saw recently these workmen for the city of New York on this island just off New York. And there they were placing in boxes, digging a long trench where they laid hundreds and hundreds of bodies. Didn't know how to understand that. Wondered what has really happened. And of course the question is, where is God in all this? Does God have anything to do with this? Where is God when I'm hurting? When our country is hurting? I'm reminded of the people of Israel who suffered many times. And when I saw that picture of laying those boxes of bodies in the trench covering it over with dirt, I was reminded of Psalm 44, where the psalmist says, Come, wake up, roust yourself. We are being brought down to the dust, our bodies cling to the ground. Wake up, God. I also believe that what we believe about God, about life, about ourselves, will determine how we look at the world, how we understand what's going on, and how we react to it. There are several ways. There's the old-fashioned way. You and I were brought up this way. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God is omnipotent. God is all loving. So then we ask the question, well, if God is all good and all powerful, why is this happening? Could it be that God is all good but not all powerful? Or could it be that God is all powerful but not all good? That will drive your question crazy, that question. The old way of understanding it, the old belief by which we look out of the world, the one you and I were raised with. It's the old theology of sin and punishment, obedience and blessing, disobedience and curse, repentance and forgiveness. It's a transaction theology. We all grew up with that. So we must wonder why is this happening? Well, God must have something to do with it. Remember the book of Job? Now, Job was a righteous man, according to the story told. By all accounts, he endured enormous suffering. We can't even imagine that kind of suffering. Read the book of Job. Why am I suffering? Well, Job's friends had an answer. He called his friends the miserable comforters. Miserable comforters. Eliphaz, Bildad, and so forth. No problem, Job. You're the one who sinned, and that's why God is doing this. You see, some of this theology always works with fear and doesn't other it. Someone has to be the blame. It can't be God. Now, the author of this story, maybe a redactor towards the end of the story, when Job says, I mean, God basically says, Job, shut up and sit down. Who do you think you are? Where were you when I created the world? I'm God. Don't question me. That same twisted God logic was used in the 14th century, the Black Plague. 25 to 30 million people across Europe. Now the church said God was punishing them for leaving the church, for being sinners. So if they repent, come back to the church, God might relent. So it's not God's fault, it's the sinner's fault. Well, 
Some theologians said, no, it was the Jews that caused it. These Christ killers, God had enough for those who believed in them. I had a friend who had a child who died. The local preacher came to comfort him by telling him that the child died to teach the father a lesson because he had fallen away from the church. Talk about what you believe determines how you look at the world. Let's go down to the tragic list of events in our own history. The Newtown Massacre. Some theologians said God allowed it because we took prayer out of the schools. Okay. The 9-11, God withheld his protection over America, over New York, because of the gay parades and the increased number of Planned Parenthood clinics. And most recently, and this is hard to believe, God did not cause this pandemic, but has allowed it in order not only to bring America back to God repentance, but the world. And as a result, they say there will be a worldwide revival, people going back to God. This is widely held in America. There are even politicians in office who aspire to this view. Now let me give you a different perspective. Let's take a look at this pandemic. Let's examine it. It is ecumenical. It is interfaith. Very liberal virus. It makes no distinction between people of color, race, creed, age, sexual orientation, whether you're a fundamentalist Christian, a liberal Christian, an atheist, whether you're rich, poor, connected. So in this crisis, we are forced to ask some new questions about our lives, about our values. We are asked perhaps to vision a new norm. Maybe the old normal is part of the reason we're going through what we're going through. Maybe this virus has showed us the inequities in our own society. But on the other hand, this is the good news. We are also witnessing an ecumenical interfaith response. Those responding to those in need they don't distinguish between race, creed, color, age, or sexual orientation. What we are seeing is that, yes, in our DNA, there is that need to protect ourselves and fear and blame the other, but also in our DNA, there is a capacity for compassion, self-sacrifice, the need for loving relationships. <clears throat> I was moved to tears when I saw video clips those apartment doors, 7 o'clock in the evening, standing outside their windows, clapping as the first responders, the poorest pay, bring the sick and dying into the hospital. I also was moved when I saw pictures of the police and fire department, clapping, cheering, throwing their blessings those nurses and doctors. A blessing is the most significant affirmation we can affirm another person, says Henry Dowd, the life of the beloved. Talk about picking up your cross following the way of Jesus. These are workers that have done just that. In our scripture lesson, Jesus said to love God with all your heart and your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. These folks were fulfilling that. They were loving the neighbors they didn't even know. Doctors, nurses, first responders, policemen, fire people. They were there at the risk of their own lives. People they did not know. But they were their neighbor. And they so loved they so sacrificed themselves. Talk about the loving spirit of God in our country, in the lives of our people. 
It was there. It is there today as people reach out. You know, Jesus, his way of looking at the world was not the old theological way. Look at our scripture lesson today. The woman was a sinner. So if you look at the world in terms of sin and punishment, of forgiveness and favor, of disobedience and curse, Jesus would have nothing to do with He saw through his eyes this woman as a beloved child of God, as we all are, worthy of love and affection, not to be condemned. She was not the other. She was God's child, as we all are. You see, what you believe about the nature and character of God will determine what we see in our world today. Will determine our understanding will determine how we respond to it. Of course, there are always those who stand on the sidelines and make their judgments. I heard one person say, well, we really got to get back to work, uh, even if it causes a lot of death. It is always the American government position, this person said, in make a choice between the loss of our way of life as Americans and the loss of the life of Americans. We have to always choose the latter. So let's get our way of life back regardless of the cost of life. Their life, my life, your life, whose life? Maybe the American way of life needs to change. Maybe we may use this time to reevaluate who we are as a nation. What are our priorities? I like the doctor who said, we all kids got to get back to school. Yes, it may cost 2%, but it's better than having them stay at home. Imagine that. Another one said, I like this one. Well, Look at the car accidents. We have thousands of those. And we still go on. We don't shut down our society because of automobile accidents. Well, I was in an automobile accident. The whole life of me. The whole life of me. Uh, that accident didn't cause two other accidents just like it. Didn't pass it on. No, the pandemic is serious. It does affect our lives. It forces us to ask questions maybe we've never asked before. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And I see the living spirit of God very much alive in those responders, in those people that give their life. There are those loud voices, and yet the soft, quiet voice of a nurse holding the dying person's hand is a voice that we need to hear. A nurse that goes out to her car cries at night. The doctors and nurses they have to be standing for parents or children who can't be with their parents or grandparents. Yet their affection, their love, for these dying people. They may not be able to put it into theological terms, but these people bear witness to the powerful love of God, which we understand and has been revealed to us in Jesus. That belief helps me understand what's going on in the world. And the response to that in 
all of those people who have come together to help each other gives me hope for all of us. Amen. Now our next song is Make Me a Channel of Your Peace, the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. It says, Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. O oh, Master, grant that I may never seek to be consoled so much as to console, to understand as to understand, to be loved as to love. Peace. Let me read to you an affirmation of faith, which I hope we all can describe to. It says, We believe that where people are gathered together in love, whether it's in their homes or out of the yard or wherever, that the Spirit of God is present. And good things can happen, and life can be full. We believe that we are immersed in mystery, that our lives are more than they seem, that we belong to each other to a universe of great creative energies whose source and destiny is God. We believe that God is after us, that God is calling to us from the depth of human life. We believe that the nature and character of God has been revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. In and with Jesus, we believe that each of us is situated in the love of God, and the pattern of our life will be the pattern of Jesus' life through self-sacrifice ever deepening and transforming experience of the risen Spirit of Christ. We believe that the Spirit of compassion is present with us, the Church, a 
as we gather to celebrate our common existence and the fidelity of God. And most deeply, we believe that in our struggle to love, we experience God's compassion in the world. And so aware of mystery and wonder caught in friendship and laughter, we become speechless before the joy in our hearts and celebrate the sacredness of life lived by the power of God's Spirit revealed in Jesus. Amen. Now, my friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. And your response, I'm sure, out there is and also with you. So how are you doing out there? You got your mask? You know, mine is a, uh, who made this? Mine is a Star Wars. What do you think? some pictures and maybe we can show them of uh, one member of our church dressed in a uh, bunny costume I don't think we can show that uh, bringing some food to one of the members of our church I think we have that and I will pass that on to, uh, to uh, Ross if you can see it I hope you're receiving calls we have our, our prayer chain and making them calls and checking up on I will call you from time to time to check up on you and see how you're doing. Uh, again, as I said before, I can still picture in my mind who is sitting where and what, and who may be snoozing, being poked by his wife. I'm hoping there will be a time when we can get back together, and I hope it's soon. In the meantime, it is my hope that you will continue to support our church support it online, or mail your pledges in. That is absolutely important to us. You also can call the church with any concerns you have, and they will give you my telephone number. Call me. Tell me how you're doing. Tell me what you need. And I'll see if I can do my best to help you. Until then, may the Spirit of God be with you and bless you. Now our closing hymn is... Help us accept each other as Christ accepted us. Teach us as sisters and brothers each person to embrace. Be present, Lord, among us and bring us to believe we are ourselves accepted and meant to love. us a view of life and encourage us to find hope and peace in that spirit be with us, be over us, around us, within us, beneath us. And let me remind you that spirit tells us that we are loved. We are loved unconditionally. So be at peace this week. Let me remind you, next week, if you want, we will be having communion. And if you want to have the juice and bread, we can share that communion together. Until then, be at peace.